ಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಯ ಸ್ವರ್ವಧರ್ಮಸ್ವೇ ಅವತಾರೇಷ್ಠಾ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಅಸತೋಮಸದ್ಗಮಯ ತಮಸೋಮ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಅಸತೋಮಸದ್ಗಮಯ ತಮಸೋಮ ಜ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯೋರ್ಮೃತಂಗಮಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಲೆಟ್ ಎಸ್ ಪ್ರೇ ಅವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಯೂಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಆಫರ್ ಅವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಯೂಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ the embodiment of infinite religious ideas the incarnation who came to integrate all the religions of the world the supreme incarnate who manifested complete humility devotion renunciation in his life who showed to the humanity that one could reach the divine through the practice of renunciation he gave a new meaning to the word renunciation which can be practiced by one and all it simply means that we should become more and more interested in the divine as we are interested in the things of the world let us pray to him to lead us from this darkness of ignorance which is causing untold suffering misery restlessness tension let us pray to him to lead us from this darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge let us pray to him to lead us from the unreal to the real god alone is the real the unchangeable absolute principle the substratum of the whole creation let us pray to him to lead us from death to immortality each one is a big diamond 
in the words of Swami Vivekananda. Each one is a diamond. What a fine statement it is. But yet, because we do not know that nature, we are passing through untold suffering. As long as our mind is sticking to the things of the world, we are bound to suffer. We do certain actions and naturally it follows in the reaction. Nobody can escape what he has done. Each one has to pay for it, whether a sinner or a saint. That is the truth. But then there is a purpose behind it. Why should we suffer? It is to learn. Suffering, learning through suffering. We should note this point. Learning through suffering. Everything in this world is for our learning. Do we understand that? If we understand it, we become completely transformed. Then we can reshape our destiny to understand this principle we must probe the inviolability of destiny on which topic I am going to speak today. How this destiny works, why it works, that is the important point that we should note. A few days back, I received a letter from India, a devotee, very sincere young man. He had written that he passed in the examination conducted for the selection of the Indian Air Force. He was very happy. But then, he was called for an interview to have medical fitness checkup. But it so happened on that day, his BP was more than the normal. He was disqualified. He became very much depressed, so much so to the extent of losing faith in the Lord whom he was meditating upon all along. Many things happen against our wish. We want to be happy. Everyone in this creation wants to be happy. But then it happens in another way. How to explain this phenomena? How to explain these events in the life? Herein comes the significance of the word destiny. It is something that is to happen or has happened to a person. The predetermined course of events is called as destiny. When we take this human birth, you must know we have brought the blueprint along with it, how we should live, how we are going to pass through this life of our present. The power or agency that determines the course of events is also termed as destiny. 
There's a famous saying, we reap what we sow. It forms the basis for destiny. Everything must have a cause as we see it now. The whole creation is playing on this cause and effect process. It is pausing through this process. We are all participants in that. The evils that are in the world are caused by nobody else but ourselves. We have caused. We are responsible for whatever the evil we see today. Much of the existing misery in the world is the effect of the past wickedness of a person. But without admitting this fact, what we do, we lay the blame of all our weaknesses upon somebody else. We want to make somebody else as a scapegoat, which is a common human fallacy. We do not look at our own faults. We are rather shy to admit our own mistakes. Here, the suffering plays a very important role to make us understand our mistakes. Suffering comes. We must analyze it and find out. Then immediately the suffering vanishes away. So what we see generally, we do not look at our own faults. The eyes do not see themselves. They see the eyes of everybody else. We are pretty slow to recognize our own weaknesses, our own faults. So long as we can lay the blame upon somebody else. If we just think about, as soon as we get up from the bed, there are some people, immediately, whatever they want to talk, they talk something rubbish of somebody else. Instead of thinking the good ideas, Instead of thinking of the divine, we think of the rubbish of somebody else. And in consequence, we become hopeless. We develop this evil so much so, we do not hesitate to put the blame on God even for our own mistakes. There are people who ask question, why has God put me in this predicament? Thus, we react distemperately over the events for which we alone were responsible. Swami Vivekananda, in his lectures on the cosmos, beautiful lecture, I hope every one of you must read Jnana Yoga of Swami Vivekananda. How beautiful and wonderful it is. I can't explain in words. They say, God cannot be described. He is indescribable. But I say, even the works of Swami Vivekananda cannot be described. The beauty of it. The content of those ideas. Infinite scope for expansion and understanding. Wonderful it is. I hope you please go through that book, Jnana Yoga, small booklet. It is available in our bookstore. So there he declares that we make our own destiny. Swamiji says, 
He gives the example of the wind. It is blowing. Everybody knows. It makes sometimes sound also, buzzing sound. The ships are moving in the sails. Those who have unfurled their sails, they catch the wind and go forward on their way. But those which have their sails furled do not catch the wind. Now, is that the fault of the wind? Is it the fault of the merciful Divine Father whose wind of mercy is blowing without ceasing day and night? Whose mercy knows no decay? Is it the fault of the merciful Father that some of us are happy and some unhappy? We make our own destiny. The Lord's sun shines for the weak as well as for the strong. His wind blows for the saint and the sinner alike. He is the Lord of all, Father of all, merciful and impartial. His infinite mercy is open to everyone at all times, in all places, under all circumstances and conditions, unfailing and unswerving. Upon us depends how we use it. Upon us depends how we utilize it. When we find ourselves suffering, we should blame ourselves and try to do better. When we pass through most difficult situations and sufferings, we feel that destiny is inviolable. It makes us to feel that way. In this context, Swami Vivekananda strikes a note of hope and assurance. He says, you must always remember that each word each thought and each action lays up a store for you and that as the bad thoughts and bad works are ready to spring upon you like tigers, so also there is the inspiring hope that the good thoughts and good deeds are ready, to, ready with the power of 100,000 angels to defend you always and forever. What a fine statement of Swamiji. Now, God's most precious gift to humanity is the intellect. By the judicious exercise of this capacity to think, he can plan, and execute schemes of his choice. But it is also seen that this faculty at times lets man down. The power to sift the best from the worst also increases and diminishes. When his intellect brightens, all his acts succeed and he effortlessly climbs the ladder of success. Hurdles are cleared automatically. But when his intellect becomes blunt, all his calculations go wrong and he fails miserably. Even his attitude may undergo a change. Certain events occur, some mysterious circumstances prevail, riddles which can't be explained by human beings are generally attributed to destiny. One may try to escape fate's clutches, but when it strikes, he has to bow. To give an illustration, there is a splendid 
illustration of this in Srimad Ramayana, a famous classic, where we can see the inviolability of destiny. Lord Rama, he willingly accepted the exile imposed on him. When he was in the forest in a hermitage, it so happened one day a fine looking beautiful golden deer was just moving there in front of the hermitage. Janaki, the consort of Sri Ramachandra, she looked at the deer, golden deer, it was so attractive and charming. She wanted that, she wanted to love it and cherish it. She wanted to keep that in her hermitage. She wanted to see that all the time. But it is jumping and running away. So he asked Sri Ramachandra to catch that deer for her. Lakshmana, the brother of Sri Ramachandra, he somehow got suspicion because the forest where they were living were all inhabited by not only wild animals but also demons who are noted for their wickedness. They would always torture the saints who were meditating and they would always take pleasure in hurting the good people. So Lakshmana cautioned Rama and advised him against going after it. But fate operated and Sri Rama's decision ultimately resulted in his temporary separation from his consort, causing intense anguish and suffering. If you go through that classic, you can have some idea about it. How he suffered a lot in the forest because of Janaki. Again in the same classic we find in another section, Sundarakanda we call Janaki was uh, in a very miserable state in, in Ashokavana, Ashoka Grove, where the demon had kept Janaki there. So there she just began to think what all had happened. And she gave expression explaining, describing her miserable state as a consequence of inscrutable fate. Noonam sakalo mrigarupa dhari maam alpa bhagyam lulubhe tadani yatrarya putram visasarja mudha ramanujam lakshmana purvajancha The meaning is there is no doubt that it was fate in the form of a deer that deluded me. Unfortunate creature that I am, and in my folly, I sent those two princes, Rama and Lakshmana, to capture it. Now, in another section in Srimad Ramayana, we call Yuddha Kanda, the section which deals with the fighting. There we see how Ravana, the most powerful demon of that age, he didn't budge from his stand, though timely good counsel was given by Vibhishana, his own brother. He stuck to his own ways, forced by inscrutable fate. As a consequence of which, the whole town was completely in flames because of the war that took place. And all the 
rakshasas were annihilated and even ravanasura also had to meet with death in mahabharata also another famous classic the inviolability of destiny is brought out through the action of dharmaraja the embodiment of virtue he is also named as yudhishthira when the invitation was extended by duryodhan his cousin brother to a game of dice then yudhishthira consulted among his brothers all of them opposed they said it is not good to go to that game they argued that even as a shrub of thorn should never be allowed to grow men of intrigue and deceit should be shunned totally duryodhana was noted for his deceitful nature we should never have any association with him we can't believe him he may play mischief he may not be honest in the game but then the eldest of the pandavas that is yudhishthira still chose to accept the invitation the consequences were calamitous duryodhana who was jealous of the popularity of his cousins he adopted the cunning method of luring dharmaraja to a gamble so life like a terrain with lots of ups and downs is made of successes and failures and of brighter as well as darker sides considering both the gains and losses as god ordained a man of wisdom will take everything in its stride and continue to do his duties without getting puffed up with pride or upset at ordeals the wheel of fortune will go on rotating and those who are made to face difficulties are bound to be elevated or restored to their normal position we find the pandavas in mahabharat representing the righteousness they were being subjected to harassment but ultimately they emerged victorious they enjoyed all comforts as princes pro pro proved their supremacy over everyone by conducting a major penance and they were privileged to secure the advice of sages and saints in the forests besides the masterly guidance of lord krishna but yet they were all forced to spend 12 years in forest undergoing miseries but at the end of a specified period the whole situation changed the pandavas while in forest they were being visited by men of erudition who tendered them advice not to get dejected at the turn of events we must never get depressed whatever may be the situation also it is not advisable to harbor undue animosity towards those who have sworn themselves as enemies as their intentions are clear in shrimad bhagavad gita there is a significant verse in the 11th chapter vishwarupa darshana yoga where lord krishna appeared in his universal form he showed that special manifestation to arjuna who then understands the true meaning of the cosmic process and 
the meaning of destiny. Arjuna was frightened to see in that universal vision the sons of Dhritarashtra together with the hosts of kings and also Bhishma, Drona, Karna along with many chief warriors on his side too. They were all rushing into large fearful mouths set with terrible tusks. Some caught between the teeth are seen with their heads crushed to powder. So this was the vision he had. Lord Krishna tells, Mayaivaite nihataha purvameva nimitta matram bhava savyasachin. O Arjuna, verily by myself have they been already slain. They have already been killed by me. You be merely an apparent cause. Even the movement of the blade of grass is done by my will, that is by the will of the divine principle. The God of destiny decides and ordains all things and Arjuna is to be the instrument, the flute under the fingers of the omnipotent. One who fulfills his own purpose and is working out a mighty evolution. Arjuna is self-deceived if he believes that he should act according to his own imperfect judgment. Nimitta matram, very significant words, merely an apparent cause. It upholds the doctrine of divine predestination and indicates the utter helplessness of the individual and the futility of his will and effort. The decision is made already and Arjuna can do nothing to change it. He is a powerless tool in God's hands and yet there is the other note that God is not arbitrary and capricious but just and loving. The ideas of God are worked out through human instrumentality. If we are wise, we so act that we are instruments in his hands. We allow him to absorb our soul and leave no trace of the ego. We must receive his command and do his will with the determination and faith in thy will is our peace. Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. Arjuna should feel nothing exists save thy will. Thou alone art the doer and I am only the instrument. In the next verse, in the same chapter, Vishwarupadashna Yoga, Bhagavad Gita, he says, Dronancha Bhishpancha Jayadratancha Karnam Tathanyana Piyodha Viran Maya Hatamstvam Jahi Ma Vethishtam Yudhyasva Jeta Rane Sapatnan O Arjuna, these famous warriors Drona, Bhishma, Jayadratha, Karna as well as all the other people they are already doomed by me. They are already doomed by me. Kill them all. Be not afraid. Fight. You shall conquer the enemies in battle. It is made very clear here that there is nothing however small or insignificant that has not been ordained or permitted by God even to the fall of a sparrow. We are to function just as an arrow at the hands of an archer. The truth is this. What is that? When God is with us, who is against us? When God is not with us, who is for us? How true it is. Three principal doctrines have evolved out of 
years of practical application by innumerable sages and saints that will continue to govern man's conduct eternally for a few events in a man's life the cause can be definitely traced if a boy fails in examination it can be attributed to lack of preparation but sometimes elaborately planned schemes fail totally human ingenuity has no valid explanation for this thirdly explanations for certain events are not convincing for instance it is beyond doubt that a leap from the top of a multi-storied building is fatal but at times a child that falls accidentally escapes unhurt linked with this is the inviolability of the law of destiny each person has to enjoy the fruits of his good acts or suffer for his misdeeds and that is why he is advised to perform only pious acts and take refuge in the divine power so that he is spared from ordeals in his succeeding life there is an incident in the life of a saint that saint was a great devotee of uh, sri ramachandra he had the vision of rama many times and people would come in large numbers to see him they would feel comfort and peace in his presence and he would encourage them to repeat the name of lord rama as many times as possible that purifies the heart of every one the divine name has that power once he said to his disciples in the course of his talks the force of destiny is terrible he referred to an incident while talking this way one day it so happened the night was very dark it was rainy there was evening service at the temple where sri ramachandra was being worshiped after the service was over all the devotees who came dispersed then this saint he called one of his disciples to follow him with a lantern because it was so dark outside and the disciple was surprised why the master is taking him now after this service what might be the reason he could not find out anyway he just obeyed the master and he went along with him so after passing through the street they come to a particular place where there was a house in a very bad condition two travelers they had come there and were taking rest this saint he went to that house he woke them up and said don't sleep here this house is dangerous it may crash any moment why do you sleep here you come to my place i will give a place for you to sleep one of the travelers heeded 
his warning and followed the master to his place. The other one, he just ignored the hint and he continued his sleep in that deserted house. At about 3 a.m. in the early morning, the same night, it so happened, one of the walls collapsed and the poor traveler was buried dead under it. It is not a story, it has happened. The saint was sorry for the man and then said, See, the force of destiny is terrible. I gave the man a clear hint about the coming danger, but he gave it no importance. He did not hear my advice. Destiny drags a person towards the inevitable. Destiny is sometimes described as the Kala Chakra, that is the wheel of time. It moves on impersonally and irresistibly. If that which moves the universe it is the will of the Supreme Lord. It creates and it destroys. It crushes its own offsprings. This is a perpetual process going on in the creation. Creation, sustenance, destruction. These three activities go on simultaneously. How many millions of persons or beings are being born every moment? How many millions are passing away. How many millions are being sustained? So this process is going on. But time possesses a divine aspect also. Time is providence. It is an expression of God's activity. God has his plan. He works it out through men. We may not and do not understand God's aims because we think on the human plane. Saints recognize the divine aims because they are inward, they are contemplating on the divine power inside and they are in direct touch with him. If a man acts in accordance with the saint's instructions, he faces providence with the least resistance. He suffers the least from the ravages of time. There is only one thing in the world which remains unaffected by time. It is, all the saints have said, it is a divine name. The divine name of the incarnations, particularly, how many incarnations have come and they, after some years they pass away. But the name of the incarnations, they remain, they remain with deep spiritual content. Hence, he who desires to be released from the clutches of time should engage himself in the repetition of the divine name. About this working of the destiny, there is another incident. There was a sultan sitting in his palace at Damascus. A young man was his favorite. He was staying with him as a guest for a few days. Suddenly he came to the king hurriedly. He was greatly agitated. He requested sultan to give him the swiftest horse so that he may go to Baghdad at once, immediately, without any lapse of time. He just wanted to quit as early as possible. The Sultan was amazed. Why it happened that way? What was the reason? He asked him why he was so hasty. The youth replied, O king, 
No doubt I am enjoying all your hospitality here. But, you know, I was walking in the palace gardens. There I saw, suddenly, death stretching out his hands. And he was looking at me. I was frightened to see him. So I decided to lose no time in escaping him. If I am here any moment, that death may take me away. Then the king allowed the favorite to take the horse. The youth mounted on the horse back and rode as fast as he could to reach Baghdad. Now after some time, the Sultan went to the garden. The death was still there, the death, the form, it was still there. Seeing him, the Sultan, he was not frightened. He questioned him, well, why did you threaten my friend who was walking here? Then death replied, O king, I did not threaten him. I threw up my arms in surprise at sense of actions rests equally on destiny and one's efforts. Of these two, destiny is the expression of the efforts made in a previous life. Destiny is the expression of the efforts made in a previous life. Every exercise of the will in thought, speech and action produces a necessary effect, good or bad, on the agent strictly in accordance with the nature of act done and this effect determines the future character of the agent's destiny. The doctrine of karma, what we call in Sanskrit, the deeds, plays an important role in working out the destiny of man. As long as we are in the realm of maya or delusion or ignorance, we are bound to be chained by this cause and effect process. Effects of action on the agent's mind is classified into Arabdha Karma, one, Anarabdha Karma, two. What is Arabdha Karma? Arabdha Karma is also called as Prarabdha Karma. Both mean the same. It is that portion of all the accumulated deeds of one's past lives which has already begun to bear fruit. It accounts for one's peculiar birth, body and character. None can escape from it without completely exhausting it by enjoying of its good and bad results. Herein is the inviolability of destiny. Now what is Anarabdha Karma? Anarabdha Karma is the storehouse of those past, present and future actions which have not as yet started to bear fruit. It has been subdivided into Sanchita, Kriyamana and Agami. The, the deeds that one had accumulated in past lives and is still in stock is called Sanchita. The deeds which one is accumulating at present is known as Kriyamana. Agami karma is that which one will accumulate in future. One has perfect control on Anarabdha karma which can be burnt to ashes by the fire of spiritual knowledge. See, a man who takes to spiritual path can change the course of destiny. 
In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says in chapter 4, Yathai dhamsi samidhognir bhasmasat kurute arjuna jnanana jnanagnihi sarvakarmani bhasmasat kurute tatha. As a blazing fire reduces fuel to ashes, so does the fire of spiritual knowledge reduces all these actions to ashes and renders the and renders the third one ineffective though operating. As long as man is pulled up by so many types of desires, the law of karma operates inexorably and he is under inviolability of destiny. Man is according to our philosophy, an autonomous self. He is responsible for what he does. His actions build up his character. The requital of actions is a fact that cannot be challenged. Man is amenable at every remove to the law of action. He assumes a fine body if his actions are good and an evil body if his actions are bad. As you sow, so you reap. A man becomes good by good actions and bad by bad actions. It is said in another famous Upanishad, Brahadaranik Upanishad, which is the revelation of the Rishis. There it is said, Punyo vai punyena karmana bhavati papaha papa neti. That is, the soul is a creative entity which creates a newer and fairer body by its own activity at every change of body. At the moment of death, the soul collects within himself all senses and faculties and after death all its previous knowledge, action and experience accompany the departed soul. When he leaves the body, he carries along with him the mind carries along with him all the tendencies lodged in the mind for working out in future births. The falling off of the body is only for the building of a newer frame either here or hereafter. The desire of the being and the resultant fruition of it through will and action is root of all happenings. By the cultivation of penance, faith, chastity, knowledge, detachment and equanimity, we can elevate ourselves to the region where the law of karma stops functioning and we are no more subjected to inviolability of destiny. Having well established in the Realization of Atman, he is no more caught under the wheel of birth and death. As I had already pointed out, there is a purpose in the function of destiny. What is that? If one is now to reap the fruits of one's past actions, that is because one was responsible for them in the past. And if it was given to one to determine one's present position by one's past conduct, there is no reason why one should not be able to determine one's future by one's present efforts. All this means that one has in oneself the freedom to do in certain ways in order that one may accomplish certain results. The law of karma only stipulates that given such and such actions, such and such results are bound to occur, just as from certain physical causes and events, certain physical effects inevitably follow. It does not paralyze one's activities, but puts them under this general command. Do this and you will attain that end. Refrain from doing this and you will not suffer that evil result. 
the doctrine of karma no doubt admits of a certain amount of determination but not at the cost of freedom it postulates determination but it is not to the exclusion of freedom there are many instances which illustrate the victory of moral and spiritual endeavor over the rule of destiny it's only through spirituality we can overcome the function of the destiny now we have the famous story of nachiketas in the again in another upanishad kathopanishad probably you are all familiar with that this young boy of fine sharp intellect and well established in purity and character he was consigned to death by his angry father but by the power of his strong will to spirituality by resolutely sticking to the path of spiritual well being in preference to the path of material prosperity nachiketas conquered death and accomplished perfection he could converse with death and he could get instructions from the god of death himself about the nature of the self how to reach that perfection again there is another story of the princess savitri this is also a very famous incident the only daughter of the king ashwapati she was destined to be a widow after a year of her marriage with prince by name satyavan but she was very thorough in her spiritual practices by her moral and spiritual endeavor she rescued her husband from the mouth of death and thus broke the fetters of destiny the life of karna in mahabharata another famous hero is another case in point he fought against the dictates of his destiny with this firm conviction that birth is determined by destiny and that man can change his destiny by his efforts man is no doubt responsible for his past karmas which determine his present state but it is up to him as a free agent to overcome the influences of his karmas by making sufficiently determined efforts with devotion dedication and service lord krishna discloses in the gita chapter 13 that the jivatman having contact with the communication with prakriti undergoes pleasure and pain karya karana kartrutve hetu prakritiruchyate purushah sukha dukkhanam bhoktrutve hetu ruchyate further again the lord says purushah prakriti sthohi bhungte prakriti jan gunan karanam guna sangosya sasadyoni janmasu the jivatman that is the individual soul seated in prakriti experiences the gunas manifesting themselves as pleasure pain and delusion born of prakriti itself attachment to the gunas is the cause of his birth in good and evil wombs in 18th chapter again shri krishna says clearly ishvara sarva bhutanam hridesha arjuna tishthati brahmayan sarva bhutani yantra arudani mayaya o arjuna the divine lord abides in the heart of all beings and by his inscrutable power causes them to turn round as though mounted on a machine the divine lord places each being on the vehicle of a body and manipulates it by the rain of the fruit of action in past lives thus the jivas are led by inviolability of destiny as long as the being is attached to the activities other than spirituality there is no escape from the rigorous laws of destiny but 
as I had already pointed out, it has a great purpose in life. The experience of pleasure and pain, Sukha Dukkha, is the foremost factor in moulding the character of the being and in educating him for the life super mundane. This Prakriti is the foster mother leading the individual soul from the unreal to the real, from the ignorance to enlightenment and from death to immortality. So, let us think about all these points and try to plan our activities in such a way that we always are conscious of what we are doing. And the more and more we become spiritual, more and more we turn inward, more and more we feel the benefit of these ideas. May God help us to practice spiritual life in all seriousness and interest. Thank you all. Thank you.